songs that way. Probably better. Well, I just hope the newer songs aren't solos. And they're not too new. According to Kyle, they're not too new. So I just hope I'm not singing by myself. Oh, no. It's the weirdest time. It's probably, probably be a live crowd. Yeah, I told him. I told him. Oh, my. 
This morning, like a lot of y'all, kind of like Lewis was this morning. Lewis want to come up here and check out to see if the battle could be won, and he put that salt out and all. I said, Lewis is kind of like that. I said, he's a, if the going gets tough, Lewis gets going, and that's what he did. He, I think a lot of y'all like this you here. This spotlight like we had this morning, uh, we are a blessed people. We've been blessed so well. I hope y'all are excited to be here because we have something that we couldn't buy, we couldn't earn, nor could our friends or family give us. We got my mercy and grace from our loving God. He loved us so much that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. People that don't like us can't take that away from us. Sickness can't take that away from us. Loss of a job. A lot of things in life can be hard to deal with, but they can't take that away from us. And uh, you'd think, I'm talking to myself more than I am most of y'all now, but you'd think if we had that, we'd be a little more happy and about ready to tell other folks about it. But they need that too. And we lost a, Paris lost a friend this week. I don't know, some of you may know him, Jack Hoskins. He was always a happy little guy when you saw him. And when I said something to uh, Kyle Jones about it, here's what Kyle said. He said he would share the gospel with everyone he met. And uh, what better legacy could any of us have? Somebody say that about us. Um, we got several sick that I'm gonna mention and I'm not gonna near, mention near all, but uh, just found out that Sandy Keith is gonna have an ablation procedure this third, this coming Thursday. Baylor Plano, I believe, Baylor Heart Hospital Plano. I'll be sure to keep her in your prayers. The ones that mentioned in the book, the Bay of Daniels, Lilla Buchanan, it's having a hard time, Dorothy Pierce, Diana Welch, Cheryl Bilby, Jerry Uh We've got quite a few families that have COVID tested positive for COVID, some of our family members have, so just pray for our whole body here that deal with the COVID if Jesus that God will heal them from it. They come down with it. Uh, 
We did have an aide out there at Steelhouse just to give y'all an update. And we now have four. Two were able to go home, Dorothy Pierce and her sister, Peggy Dotson were able to go home. Two uh, moved on and they're with Jesus now. So the ones that's left there, Rosella Lilly, Naomi and John, Johnny Bassett, and Robert Wilson. So y'all keep them in your prayers. And if this gets where you it's better about visiting, it's pretty it's pretty bad right at the moment. Probably wouldn't be a good time to go out there. Maybe a little later they say they're gonna take you out. If you get a chance, try to visit some of the places. Uh Jerry's and we used to call it pine tree, but still called pine tree over there. And uh, so if you will now, if you go with me in prayer, then we'll continue in our worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come here this morning. We come here to worship you. We pray that it's acceptable to you and pleasing to you. We pray that our prayer and our songs come up to you as a pleasing incense and pleasing aroma. Father, we pray for those that are sick. We pray that you will bless them and heal them, and we know you can do those things. We have faith you can do that. You can heal us and you can heal others. We pray that those that have lost loved ones, comfort them, give that family there. Jack Hoskins, some of our families that recently lost loved ones since Daisy Reddy, Claude Jones. Father, go with us, mellow our hearts, help us be, realize we need to be like you, like Jesus. Help us show mercy to other, other people when they need it. Help us be ready to forgive other people like you forgive us. We know we need to do that just because it's being like you and like Jesus, but also it's, it's necessary for, for us to do that, for you to continue to forgive us. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for letting your only son come here, die on that cross in place of us. We thank you, Jesus, for being willing to do your Father's will. Give yourself up for us. Help us always remember that how you came back to life and lives forever. He's coming back for us. Help us remember that each day as we go through life. Father, help us love one another so much that we can still worship and call each other brother when we may not agree with each other on everything. We can still be on that same journey, still trying to go the same direction toward you. Help us, help us humble ourselves and be able to have unity amongst us as believers. Father, be with us this morning here as we worship. Be with Randy. Help us, help him bring the word to us and let's find things in there that will help us love. Be better Christians. Help us enjoy life better and know that we have eternal life through Jesus. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Walk the pilgrim's pathway, clouds will over. 
the song before David uh, comes and prepares our mind for the Lord's Supper will be, It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Father, you are awesome and you are holy, and we thank you for everything that you are. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to come to this earth and live his life for us and ultimately give it to us. Thank you for the body that was broken. Thank you for the blood that was spilled that gives us hope, that provides a new covenant that we can 
live this life and look forward to an everlasting home with you. I pray that we take that with us always, that it becomes part of us, and that we always share that with those around us. I pray that this time, this worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Since we are such a small group this morning, my fear is this song might be newer. Kyle Jones swears to me it's not, but uh, I really don't want to sing by myself. So let's uh, really belt it out if we can. <laughs> the splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth Sing 
home congregation on a Sunday when there are about 25 of us uh, here. Uh, so Ryan, well done. Uh, you did sound like you were singing a solo uh, once or twice. It was good. It was a good solo. But anyway, we're, we're thankful that uh, Ryan and Lacey and their children and their family are, are with us. Before I had Ryan's phone number plugged into my phone, uh, I got a text this is this is a couple of months ago late one night it was a 903 area code and obviously someone from church or from paris who was at an oklahoma city thunder basketball game and i just went along with it really not knowing who i was exchanging text with and later it dawned on me that was ryan welch so I'm thankful that Brian is back here, not if, if for no other reason, just to be able to talk Thunder basketball with him a little bit. You know what? Few people follow the NBA here, Ryan. It's a Maverick thing. So. Well, I know, I know, but at least at least you'll talk Thunder with me. Uh, at least acknowledge that there might be another team very close. But anyway. While Brad was uh, sharing uh, Shepherd's Prayer with us this morning, Daryl uh, received a text that Anita Roden fell yesterday morning and uh, evidently uh, broke her nose, required some stitches, was taken uh, to the emergency room. She'll be uh, further evaluated uh, this week uh, at the doctor's office and so as soon as we get an update on Anita's condition, we'll be sure and let everyone know. Uh, but please uh, remember her uh, in your prayers. Uh, and as Brad mentioned, we have so many families dealing uh, with the virus uh, right now, the Baggett family uh, being one of those. And I corresponded with Jared on Friday afternoon and he thought they were pretty much over the hump, and then Lori checked in with Christy yesterday, and Jared woke up sick uh, yesterday morning. So keep the baggage uh, in your prayers as well as uh, all those other uh, families. Please remember that our Bible classes, uh, because of the outbreak of the virus, will be dismissed. Uh, on Sunday mornings until Sunday, February the 6th. And our Bible classes on Wednesday evening will be dismissed until Wednesday evening, February the 9th. We will continue to uh, send out reminders, uh, reminders uh, via the various outlets that we use. Uh, you may know of some that maybe don't check email as often or maybe don't have email uh, they might be older they might be younger uh, but if you know some of our folks like that be sure uh, and correspond with them we're trying to do our best to keep everyone as informed and updated as uh, possible now when jesus saw the crowds he went up on a mountainside and sat down his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs 
is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Several years ago, in an issue of uh, Christian history, uh, a periodical produced by Christianity Today, editor Mark Galley reflected upon the Beatitudes, and he wrote these words. When I hear Jesus' words, especially hard words, like the Beatitudes, I sometimes dismiss them. Impossible. Maybe Jesus could live them. After all, he was both God and man, but not mere mortals. This baneful theology I readily reject with my mind, but all too readily accept with my heart, and thus my moral resolve slackens. This morning, we continue our congregational study of the Sermon on the Mount that I have titled Radical Discipleship, Spending Some Moments on the Mount with Jesus. And in Sermon 2 this morning, we want to look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12, the text that I just uh, read for you. That, of course, has traditionally been known as the Beatitudes. I have titled this lesson, Those Who Receive God's Favor. So this morning, please open up your New Testament to Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to take a brief look at uh, this powerful text, this very challenging text, uh, the words that Jesus chose to begin the Sermon on the Mount uh, with. Well, first of all, a beatitude in the Bible is a literary form that begins with the word blessed and affirms God's favor and presence upon certain people. The Greek word is typically the adjective makarios, and it's used some 50 times in the New Testament. And we find this word used not only uh, in the words of Jesus, but literally with all the New Testament writers. Uh, quite often, Paul, in his letters, will speak or write of people who are blessed. Peter does as well. So does James. The Apostle John in the book of Revelation has seven Beatitudes uh, in that book. Seven times we find verses that begin with the word blessed. This word I find quite interesting in its secular usage. It's often used to describe the internal or external conditions, such as wealth or honor, which typically, usually, assured one of happiness. And because of that, this word was often used by pagan people to describe the state of the gods they worshiped, who were above earthly sufferings and labors. It often was used to describe the social stratum of the wealthy who because of their riches appear to be above the normal cares and worries of the poor. It was also used to describe the dead who were no longer subject to the pain of life. And so it is this word with that background that Jesus and the New Testament writers chose to use to describe those who find special favor with God. So let's go back to chapter uh, 5 and look at verses 3 through 12 where nine times we find the word blessed. In the first eight Beatitudes that begin in verse 3 and continue through uh, verse 10, 
Jesus uses uh, the third person plural in his presentation. And the reality is there is no verb. Now our English translations supply a verb, blessed are, but literally it is blessed, the poor in spirit, blessed uh, the merciful, blessed the persecuted, and so forth and so on. He actually doesn't use a verb and the second person plural until we get to verse 11. And I'll have uh, some more comments about that in just a moment. If you look at a variety of English translations, occasionally you'll find a translation that chooses to translate this word as happy. I think that can be misleading. I still will contend that blessed is the best choice uh, of words to translate makarios. The English word happy has as its root the Latin word hap, which means chance. So a person is happy because good fortune and circumstances are favorable to him. So happiness is a subjective state dependent upon external conditions. However, as the language that Jesus uses suggests, he's making an objective judgment. Because when you think about it, the circumstances that those who are blessed here in these Beatitudes, the circumstances they find themselves in are not what we would call happy. To be mournful, to be persecuted. You know, those are circumstances that we would not enjoy. And, and typically, when we look at people in those circumstances, we would not necessarily say they are happy. So what Jesus is doing in the Beatitudes, and in reality, the other New Testament writers, he's making an objective judgment. He is declaring or pronouncing not what we may feel, but what God thinks of us. So I would define blessed this way. To be blessed is to be the recipient of God's favor and to experience a deep inner joy, having faith in God who is above all human events and in, in who is in control of all human circumstances. So even if we are mourning, even if we are being persecuted, even when we are in a difficult circumstance and we're trying to be a peacemaker, we may not be experiencing happiness but we can experience being blessed because God is looking upon us with favor and he is above those circumstances that we may find ourselves in. One of the uh, best-selling theological books of this past year uh, was a book written by uh, Rebecca Eklund and in this book, she traces a history of interpretation of each one of the Beatitudes. And in her introduction to each Beatitude, she um, traces again uh, some of the approaches that a variety of people in a variety of circumstances, how they have looked at the Beatitudes and applied them to their lives and uh, the life situations that they found themselves in. And in this study, she also discusses this, this scholarly debate um, b between you know, academians wondering whether these Beatitudes are descriptive or are they prescriptive? In other words, are these ethical demands that Jesus is placing upon us, are these things that we should pursue or are they again just announcements 
uh, maybe even congratulations to those who are already in those states. And so Eklund kind of concludes that it doesn't necessarily have to be an either or, but perhaps a both and. In an analyzation of the way Matthew kind of structures the Beatitudes, certainly might suggest uh, that. It's interesting, with the first four Beatitudes that begin in our English translations in verse three uh, and conclude in verse um, seven, there are 36 words. And those who are blessed all begin with the letter P. Then we get to verse eight and the final four blessings, guess what? There are 36 words. And so this structure might suggest that the first four Beatitudes are more descriptive of the disciples' relationship with God and have to deal more with our vertical relationship with God. And the final four are more prescriptive, things that we should be doing of a disciple's relationship to others. And so the final four Beatitudes would emphasize the horizontal relationships that we have in our lives. So I would argue, again, that it's not an either or kind of thing. It is, it is a both and that these Beatitudes are a combination of declarations and directives, emotions and ethics, and congratulations and commands. Their application depends on the frequent changing of a disciple's circumstances. So during those times that we are mourning, whether it's because of a loss of a loved one or uh, some other kind of loss, or maybe even spiritually speaking, uh, just when, when we mourn our own sinfulness and a loss of innocence in our lives, to be assured that God will provide comfort. For those occasions when uh, we see conflict between people, uh, to take advantage of being what Jesus challenges us to be and become a peacemaker and try to reconcile. And so an application of these uh, Beatitudes, again, kind of depends on our life's circumstances at the moment. Well, those are the first eight Beatitudes. Right? When we get to verse 11, once again, Jesus uh, identifies a group of people that he calls blessed. And so verses 11 and 12 seem to be a, a link, if you will, between the first eight Beatitudes and what Jesus will then say uh, in verses 13 through 16, where he challenges us to be salt and light. And that, of course, will be the text we discuss uh, next week. They serve as a transition. Uh, and Jesus is, again, encouraging his disciples. Uh, he understands that if they follow him, truly become a disciple of his, they are going to face some persecution. And so he reminds them of the company that they will be in, the prophets of old. And that will especially continue when uh, they seek uh, to be salt and light. I don't have time this morning, or not going to take the time, to look at all eight or nine of these Beatitudes. So I want to choose two this morning uh, to comment uh, briefly on and extend a challenge uh, to us. And so this week, I would encourage you, uh, after you read the Sermon on the Mount tomorrow morning, and after you work through the little devotional in our congregational uh, devotional book, uh, to then spend the rest of your time this week uh, looking at each of these Beatitudes individually and in, in seeking some personal application, again, depending upon where you might be in your life uh, at this moment.
But the two I would like to discuss this morning, the first is verse five. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. To be meek means to show patience and humility. It means to be gentle. It means to be submissive. In fact, our English word is derived from an old word which means soft. However, the biblical term in no way connotes weakness or softness. It is not the shy ones, the unassertive, the intimidated, nor the doormats, as some have suggested, uh, as Eklund points out in her book, Studying the History, the Translation and Application of this particular uh, beatitude. Right? Meekness is an attitude, it's not a condition. Some of you uh, might remember from your world history, the great Greek philosopher Aristotle. Aristotle, in uh, one of the books he wrote, uh, analyzed a number of words and uh, sought to define them for his uh, students. And here is what he said about the word meekness. It is the mean between excessive anger and excessive apathy. So it's, it's, it's right in the middle from flying off the handle to not having any care or concern <laughs> about it. It's interesting, this word can often, or, or was often used to describe a gentle cooling breeze or a soothing ointment. It's used to describe a thoroughbred that was once wild, but which has become obedient to the bit and the bridle. So me, meekness, I would argue, is strength under control. It is to be harnessed by God. It is a power under restraint. It is the ability to be uh, self-effacing. It is not shyness or insecurity or timidity or even apprehensiveness. Uh, you might remember in the book of Numbers, Moses was described as the meekest man in all the earth. Moses was not weak. Moses was not soft. He was harnessed by God to lead his people. And so notice the blessing or the promise attached to those who are meek. Jesus says they will inherit the earth. A lot of debate about what that little phrase, inherit the earth, means. It seems very apparent. Jesus is reflecting upon Psalm 37. If we took time to go back and read Psalm 37, three times the psalmist uh, writes of God's people inheriting the earth. Some scholars will argue that a better translation of earth is land. So the meek will inherit the land. Any Jew, when they heard the word land, would think of the promised land, the land where they uh, now primarily live. I would take that even a step further and suggest that land here means life with God. And so to inherit the earth means winning the world with meekness, or what I like to call the art of subtle wooing, W-O-O-I-N-G. Now we know what it means to woo. I spent several months when I was in college, after Lori moved to Ada, to woo her. And eventually she said yes. And I'm thankful for that. So we might form an acrostic with this word woo, 
which simply means win others over. And as our video suggested this morning in uh, the spotlight, how do we typically inherit the land? Well, how do governments do it? Through military might, through power, through wealth, through education, all of those things. And yet Jesus says, you know, if you really want to take this world over, we don't even have to fire a shot. Let's just be like Jesus and live in such a way that we win people over to him by the way we interact with those uh, people. The second uh, beatitude this morning, just to quickly spend a little bit of time with, look at verse seven. Blessed are the merciful. The biblical concept of mercy typically points in one of two directions. Very regularly when we read about mercy, it's, it's moving in the direction of forgiveness. Either our forgiveness before God or uh, our forgiveness with others or forgiving other people. The other direction is kindness, compassion that is shown to someone in need. So this beatitude embraces the characteristics of being generous, forgiving others, having compassion for the suffering, and providing care for the unfortunate. This beatitude echoes what I like to call the Micah mandate. Micah chapter six and verse eight. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Well, three things, according to the prophet Micah, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And the blessing or the promise attached to those who are merciful is that they will receive mercy. And of course, God is the epitome of someone who extends mercy. Uh, this particular uh, description of God is found, I think, five to six times in the Old Testament. The first occurrence is in Exodus 34 and verse 6. The Lord passed before him, that is Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So mercy is one of the fundamental attributes of God. What Jesus is declaring here is mercy extended is predicated by mercy received. Or in other words, because we have received mercy as disciples of Jesus, we are to extend mercy as well. Let me ask a question. If you had to choose between a world where mercy always wins or justice always wins, which would you choose? I think most of us would probably choose justice. And I can think of three reasons why we might choose that. Well, number one, when we compare ourselves to others, we look pretty good, or at least we think we look pretty good. Number two, we often actually enjoy seeing the bad guy get his due. Maggie will be the only one who understands this probably, but I hope the University of Southern Cal loses every single game next year. I want that coach who left us to lose, to fail. That would be justice because of the disappointment and the disruption he has caused to our football team. Or number three, we fear those who receive mercy will 
abuse it. Jesus will address this issue of mercy even more when we get to the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6. When a part of the Lord's Prayer may be better labeled as the disciples' prayer, it's what we should be praying, and in that prayer, to ask for forgiveness. And you might remember, at the conclusion of the prayer, Jesus immediately, before he addresses anything else in the sermon, he has additional commentary to this idea of forgiveness. We only receive forgiveness. We only receive mercy if we extend it as well. It's probably been, I think, almost 30 years ago now. Uh, two Duke theologians by the name of Stanley Hammerwass and William Willimon wrote a provocative little book titled Resident Aliens. And in a good portion of this book, they reflect upon the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and at least their understanding of how to apply these challenging words. And here's a brief paragraph from Resident Aliens where they discuss the Sermon on the Mount. God has promised to form a new, a peculiar people through the cross of Christ. The sermon, like the rest of scripture, is addressed neither to isolated individuals nor to the wider world. Rather, <laughs> here are words for the church, a prefiguration of the kind of community in which the reign of God will shine in all its glory. So there is nothing private in the demands of the sermon. It is very public, very political, in that it depicts the public form by which the church shall witness to the world that God really is busy redeeming humanity, reconciling the world to himself in Christ. All Christian ethical issues are therefore social, political, communal issues. Can we so order our life together that the world might look at us and know that God is busy? And so the question I would ask of us this morning does our community, does the city of Paris, do, do the people we work with, the people we associate with, the people we stand in line at Walmarts <laughs> with, do they see that God is busy among us? Are, are, are we making ourselves available to God as disciples of Jesus to be what he declares us to be. And we'll get into that more next week when we talk about <laughs> in life. Does our community see God at work in our midst? Ryan's going to lead us in an invitation song. We'll have people up front to pray if you need uh, prayers or any kind of encouragement, please come while we stand and sing. Just as I am without one being, but